Welcome to the fifth installment of A Journey to the Psychedelic Revival, a series sponsored by Penn Nursing. My name is Randolph Mowski. I'm a senior student in Penn Nursing Psychiatric Mental Health Nurse Practitioner Track. Prior to this, I earned my bachelor's degree of science in nursing and psychology at Stony Brook University of New York. I began my career here at Stony Brook University's Hospital Comprehensive Psychiatric Emergency Program, which happens to be one of the largest psychiatric emergency departments in my home state of New York. I cared for patients across a lifespan, suffering from a variety of psychiatric issues. It was disheartening to witness how poorly managed many of these patients were and to watch them repeatedly return for the same issues. Many patients were unable to access timely and reliable treatment or felt adverse to starting psychiatric medications due to its ongoing stigma. Others have been trialed and failed on too many medications to list, spending years with worsening symptoms and a litany of side effects for medications which never proved beneficial. It dawned on me that perhaps there were other avenues of treatment that should be explored. At the time, I wasn't aware of psychedelic therapy, but I now realize this was exactly the kind of breakthrough I always imagined for these forgotten patients. Fast forward only a few years later, I'm extremely excited about the direction and support that psychedelic therapy is garnering, especially in patients suffering from depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation. This movement is quickly proving to hold tremendous promise for not only becoming a new mainstay of treatment, but also challenging our pre-existing beliefs of health and well-being. As we all know by now, this learning series was designed to explore psychedelic assisted therapies over a course of six sessions. Our first session explored the rich history and culture surrounding psychedelics. Our second session described what to expect during psychedelic therapy. During our third session, we discussed the fascinating neuroscience and pharmacology involved with psychedelics. The fourth segment shed some light on the training involved to become a psychedelic therapist. If you missed these previous sessions, the recordings are available online and the link will be posted later in the chat. Tonight's session will explore the post-legalization landscape, future considerations for psychedelic therapy, insurance structures, clinical models, and the field of mental health might change. We'll explore the topics of legalization, decriminalization, and the FDA approval process. Following tonight, our final session will again be led by experts in our field discussing the future of psychedelics and how people gain access to them. Please note, you need to register separately for each session. Before we begin, I would like to thank this moment, our School of Nursing Dean, Dr. Antonia Villaruel, for supporting this series. In addition to the Dean's support, we have a hardworking team operating behind the scenes to make this happen. Thank you to our team and for your dedication for this series. Two items of housekeeping before we get started. One, unfortunately, some attendees have reported experiencing tech issues. We apologize for any inconveniences as we are working diligently to avoid these happening. A few suggestions that may help. If you're experiencing a poor connection, please try closing out any extra browsers or programs running on your computer. We also find this platform works best on Google Chrome. Lastly, if you are someone you know cannot log on to sessions, the easiest thing to do is re-register for the events and you will get a new event right away. If you continue to experience tech issues, you will notice that at the bottom of the event email, there's a link to the BlueJeans tech support team, which can be used to contact BlueJeans directly. And secondly, if you are interested in receiving nursing continuation education credit, we will post the link for the eval in the chat near the end of the session. So please keep an eye out for that and know it'll be posted before the session is over. The deadline for submitting for credits is this Sunday night, March 20th at midnight. A certificate will be sent via email by April 12th after the conclusion of this series. I hope that clears up some of the most common questions and issues that we've been experiencing. Feel free to utilize the chat to ask anything else. You're in for another thoughtful and provoking, engaging journey. Listening to a personal story is a great way to illuminate how valuable psychedelic assisted therapies can be. That's why we start each session with a short video created by Reconsider to humanize and personalize this type of therapy. Afterwards, I'll introduce our moderator for tonight, Stephen Apgon. For tonight's session, rather than a presentation, Stephen will moderate a panel discussion with three experts in the field of psychedelic medicine. Our panels will be engaged in a conversation, which will be followed by our usual Q&A. Please use the Q&A function rather than the chat for any questions that you would like to ask for tonight's panelists. You'll be able to like your favorite questions, which will help us identify which questions should be prioritized. We'll do our best to make sure as many questions as possible are answered. If you have any questions that aren't specifically directed to tonight's speakers, please post them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. For tonight's video, we're going to hear Jeff and Jill's story. Jeff is a former Navy SEAL. My name is Jeff, a uh, retired SEAL. My dad passed going into high school. I was 14 years old. 
I always get this sort of reaction, you know, from folks when they're like, you know, you're a Navy SEAL and they find out my dad was in the Peace Corps and they view it as two very different things and I, I never did. Someone has to be able to stabilize an area so that people like my dad, good people, could come in and, and do their work. I met him right before his first deployment. You know, I'd never met anybody that intense. I would ask him a question and he would very intensely look at me to answer it. He was really smart, really funny, loves people and feels things very strongly. And I was attracted to that. I remember at some point, I was like 15 years uh, in the service and I'd never spent more than three months consecutively um, at my home. I was constantly needed to overwhelm myself with activity, movement, uh, for fear of stopping. Because what happens when you stop? And I think that's the cost, is what if you're good at something that isn't good, but necessary in some cases. But that becomes the burden that you, you have to carry. No one else can carry that. I remember coming back from a deployment and my oldest son was at church and was singing. And so I was sitting there looking around and all these parents are smiling and they've got their video cameras out and their phones and they're all having a great time. And I'm sitting there and I just get nothing, like no emotional connection to what I was doing there, you know, with my son. And my wife made this comment that, that I wasn't the same person. I remember saying like, yeah, this is me now. Like that doesn't exist anymore. It seemed like there were more and more arguments that just kind of got out of control to where it would almost make, wouldn't make sense why he was so upset. So she reached out to the unit that I was at at the time and, and basically um, asked for help. Then we found out this isn't the first person the majority of my peers were all dealing with the same thing. I mean, you hear PTSD, but nobody talked about it. So from 2014 to 2018, I had been on antidepressants, and then, but then also stimulants and uh, stuff to help me sleep. And then I'd try to get off of them, and it was painful. It left me with an understanding of how people get to the point where they're done. Probably about two years after I retired, and I was still on medications, not able to get off of it, I came across a friend who I hadn't seen in a while, and I looked very different than what he was used to seeing me. And then he texted me later and was like, dude, I didn't even recognize you. Like, are you okay? Like, what's going on? And I was like, eh, struggling, but whatever, man. It's nothing new. And he's like, hey, I went through this treatment and changed my life. I, all right, man, you say it works, I'll go, I'll go do it. That was so far out there that it was like when he told me that, I was like, what are you talking about? But I think at that point, it was like, he's tried a lot of other things. So we went down to Mexico, we took the medicine and it's like nothing's happening. I'm laying down physically in this world, but in this experience, I'm standing up, hovering over two giant cylinders that represented the negative and, and the positive. And suddenly the bottom of those two cylinders just opened up and everything flushed out and it was incredibly relieving like all that stuff years just gone gone and I felt my consciousness like kind of fall through myself and like through death but then sudden, somehow everything was in a different direction and, and and it was like being blasted towards love and just this like graciousness and what, the only way I could describe is what I would imagine God to be like. 
I remember coming out of it and feeling all the pain and sadness in the world. And it was like overwhelming. It was like I started weeping and realized that all the things I was so stressed out about, so concerned about, like just are not real. They're not important. And it was incredibly, incredibly liberating. I was able to forgive myself and then have a different perspective of those experiences. I think he's more accepting of himself and he's a lot easier on himself. And that I think helps his relationships, you know, with me and with the kids. It's not like he's a different person and unrecognizable or, you know, anything like that. It's kind of the Jeff that he was when we met when we were younger. <laughs> I was able to make long term changes, not only just in behavior and habit, but also how I think. That's how you sustain change. The previous approaches of just looking for, you know, a pill or a shot, you're putting the responsibility of healing on those things as opposed to what plant medicine did was open the door for me to put the responsibility of healing on me um, and then make it last. It's been a hard <laughs> um, journey, but I always felt blessed to be on it with Jeff. As hard as it was, I always felt very like, grateful to be on it with him. You know, when I think about the future, I know that I'll continue the journey with him and I'm good with that. Special thank you to Jeff and Jill for sharing your story of resilience. Hearing your testimony on this treatment's efficacy gives us all hope about the potential of this type of therapy. Tonight's installment will be moderated by Stephen Apcon, an award-winning filmmaker and social entrepreneur. Altogether with his partner, Marcina Hale, is the co-founder of Reconsider. For those regularly tuning in, you've already watched some of Stephen and Reconsider's work via the Stories of Transformation short films, which accompany each session and aim to humanize the psychedelic experience. Mr. Apcon is the director and producer of Disturbing the Peace, which received the first Roger Ebert Humanitarian Award. Together with Ms. Hale, LMFT and trained psychedelic therapist, He's an executive producer of Fantastic Fungi. He is the founder and former executive director of the Jacob Burns Film Center, a nonprofit film and education center located in Pleasantsville, New York. Mr. Rapcon is also the author of The Age of the Image, Redefining Literacy in a World of Screens. Reconsider is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to create a more conscious and connected way of life by supporting the emergence of transformative medicine, including psychedelics, to address today's mental health and collective challenges. Reconsider has established a Center for Transformation in the Hudson Valley, supporting a wide range of programming initiatives with a particular focus on veterans, first responders, and healthcare workers. Without further ado, here is Stephen Apcon. Thanks, Randy, and thanks to the whole UPenn team for putting together this amazing series. I've had the chance to see all of the sessions so far, and they've been, each been wonderful in their own right, but collectively they've provided a fantastic overview of this re-emerging field of psychedelics. And it's also been a real pleasure to be collaborating with UPenn, and I want to thank the Reconsider team here, especially Sean Gallagher, Marcina, Justin Drabinsky, and Susie Luden for their work in creating these stories, transformations that have opened each evening. And I also want to um, extend my thanks along with you, Randy, to Jeff and Jill for their courage and vulnerability in sharing their story. Uh, Randy mentioned the topic of tonight's event, and as broad as it is, it made sense to bring together a panel, and we have a great one for you. Dr. Rachel Yehuda is a professor of psychiatry and neuroscience, the director of the Center for Psychedelic Psychotherapy and Trauma Research, and the director of the Traumatic Stress Studies Division at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. She also leads the PTSD Clinical Research Program at the James J. Peters VA Medical Center in the Bronx. Dr. Yehuda has authored more than 500 papers, chapters, and books in the field of traumatic stress and the neurobiology of PTSD. And her research is focused on PTSD and combat veterans the children of Holocaust survivors, and the children of pregnant women who survived the 9-11 attacks. She's also one of the most compelling speakers on these topics. We're thrilled to have her with us. Dr. Scott Shannon is a psychiatrist and has also been a student of consciousness since his honors thesis on that topic at the University of Arizona in the 1970s. 
He's also one of the medical professionals who's had extensive experience with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, having incorporated it into his practice until it was scheduled in 1985. Dr. Shannon's published four books on holistic and integrative medicine, mental health. He's a past president of two national medical organizations and currently teaches ketamine-assisted psychotherapy widely through his organization, Prati. Dr. Shannon also serves as a site principal investigator and therapist for the phase, two, phase three trial of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, sponsored by MAPS at the Wholeness site in Fort Collins. Dr. Stephen Ross is a research associate professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at NYU's Grossman School of Medicine. Dr. Ross is a founding member of the NYU Psychedelic Research Group and is currently Associate Director of NYU Langone Center for Psychedelic Medicine and Director of the Psychedelic Medicine Research Training Program. Dr. Ross's main research interests focus on developing novel pharmacological psychosocial approaches to treating addictive disorders, including uh, the intersection between pain and addiction, psychiatric and existential distress, associated with advanced or terminal cancer, major depression, PTSD, personality disorders. And he also is a University of Pennsylvania alum where his son is currently a freshman. So with that, I'd like to open up this panel with you, Dr. Ross. Uh, you've been working on some of the earliest psychedelic studies in this current reemergence, re uh, with studies going back to 2006 on the use of psilocybin for many of the indications that I mentioned before. As a researcher for well more than a decade, you're now seeing these medicines emerging from the lab. And it makes sense to start with you for that reason. Your focus has been on psilocybin, although I understand you're moving along on a study of the use of LSD for cancer-related pain. But psilocybin's received breakthrough status from the FDA, and it appears to be close on the heels of MDMA for approval. As we've learned in past sessions in this series, this approval is not just for a medicine, a pill, but it's also for a thera therapeutic process. And what exactly do, do you think this will look like in practice as these medicines become legal? Well, first of all, thanks for uh, having me. As you said, it's a real honor for me to be here, given that I went to Penn uh, for college and that my son Jacob is a freshman there. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to Penn, Penn Nursing. Um, yeah, it, it's a great question in terms of what comes next. We're, we're kind of at the cusp of psychedelics potentially being available as prescription medications in the next few years. Uh, the most advanced is MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, and that's, you know, one phase three, one pivotal study away potentially from getting approval. The first phase three uh, study, um, the results were extremely promising, and, and the second pivotal trial is nearing completion. And so MDMA may be a prescribable medication by 2023 or so, to be used in conjunction with psychotherapy. It's important that it's not just administering the medication by itself. It's vital that it's in conjunction with um, ill psychotherapy. Um, but psilocybin is sort of on the heels of that. And there are three programs of psilocybin research that are the most advanced. Uh, the first is the use of psilocybin to treat major depressive disorder. And uh, there are currently phase two trials that are active uh, one of them I'm involved with um, that's uh, sponsored by the USONA Institute. Uh, we're nearing the end of a phase two trial in 100 participants, and uh, a group Compass has done a bigger trial in about 250 participants. So the data is starting to come out about psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for major depression and treatment-resistant depression. Um, the other uh, program of research that's pretty far along is the work we've done using psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy to treat depression, anxiety, and existential distress in advanced or terminal cancer, and also other life-threatening conditions. And I would say that's the area that I'm most focused on now. And we're working with NCI and, and um, some other funding entities to do advanced trials using psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy to treat uh, psychiatric and existential distress in cancer. Um, and the other indication is the use of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy to treat alcohol use disorder. When psychedelics were part of psychiatry, the, the first wave from the 50s to 70s, the most promising indication was the use of LSD to treat alcoholism. And so um, Michael Bogenschutz and I at NYU picked up on that, and, and we have completed a trial using psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy in 95 participants that have alcohol use disorder, and we'll be looking to publish that soon and, and have plans to move beyond that into the next phase of things. So 
I think one of those three programs of research, if the larger trials prove efficacy, um, then they potentially could be historically rescheduled by the FDA from Schedule One to be available as a prescription medication, very likely to be constrained by the REMS program of FDA, that um, they'll have to be used in conjunction with psychotherapy. And, and then it gets very interesting to see how they um, are disseminated and importantly, how they get to everybody, including the most vulnerable, those that don't normally have access to care. It's key that from the justice principle of the Belmont report that these treatments become widely available and safely used. And so, yeah, we're, we're at the cusp of things, but you know, we, we have to be careful to learn from history because uh, the first go around, there was an exciting phase, which we're in now, and then soon after that, things went off the rails and, and psychedelics were demonized and, and uh, led to the war on drugs and were kind of banished for many decades. We're going we're gonna to get into that, but uh, um, as you set up, there's a, there's, this is not just about a medicine being approved, but it's a medicine being approved with a therapeutic process. And Dr. Yehuda, you think broadly about community healthcare systems, and you also work within a particular single payer system at the VA. And right now, what seems to be on track is this approval for an engagement of therapists and psychiatrists. And we have, we're going from a, um, from a world of um, hundreds of participants in these trials to a much bigger population. How does it play out in regards to reaching those most in need, like your patients at the VA, and what's needed to ensure that these medicines are available to all in need? Well, um, first of all, thank you. Good evening, and thrilled that you invited me to participate. And I really appreciated Dr. Ross's answer. I think it was very careful and comprehensive. So thank you very much for that. And on the heels of that, I would just say that I don't think we're up to that question yet of how this gets broadly disseminated because it's too early to do that. So I don't think it's too early to start thinking about it and starting to imagine it, but it's going to be years before I think, especially community-based systems move in that direction. I think um, it may start with private practice or kind of um, maybe the kind of clinics that are now being designed for ketamine-assisted psychotherapy might adopt um, psychedelics or academic centers through research protocols. Um, but before this kind of treatment is widely disseminated in community settings, I think many people would like to see studies um, that are done on this population. And the reason this is so important is because the needs of people that are being served in the community may actually be different needs, especially in the preparation and the aftercare. And so, you know, we have to understand that what we've learned so far is from research um, that is an artificial universe in some way, by design, actually, but, you know, it's not the real world. There's always this abyss between clinical research and clinical practice. And um, we've learned a lot of other things from anecdotal reports, maybe such as in the film we saw, which was very touching, but we have a lot of people just telling us about their personal experiences, whether in a trial or not. So until we bring these um, approaches into those settings, with the providers that know these populations well and know their needs well, um, we're not going to have the answer to how to do this because we're not going to have the answer to what else the need is. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to need to do before even thinking about this equity principle, which I deeply share this concern with Dr. Ross, is we're going to have to train therapists. Um, this is a very big undertaking. And sure, you know, you can log on for an evening or a series of evenings and listen to people chat about, you know, what psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is like. But to actually learn how to be therapist and work with these medicines is going to require a commitment. It's going to probably 
be expensive, at least to someone, <laughs> right? And um, it's also going to present some very interesting departures from what you may have learned about in medical school or graduate school or studying for nursing degree or social work. Um, and so we want to be very prepared for all of that. Yeah, I I, th I think that you know one of the things that as you were talking, I was thinking that you're really talking about the research after the research, that there's a translational piece that's so critical. Yeah, there's there's research that is being done to get these medicines and medicines with psychotherapy FDA approved. That's really important because currently these substances are not legal. So it's very important that the FDA approves these medicines, but some people like me, I will speak for myself and not others, um, think that that's just the beginning. That just gives um, a very big potential and opportunity for more studies that would be um, more broad based in the kind of settings that really conduct clinical trials and try to learn about how different approaches work. So it's a very important beginning. It's not an end. Yeah. No, that's that's wonderful. And I, I think that that it's a perfect segue to this question of, you know, you mentioned preparation and integration for communities, but also the facilitation of the experience itself. And and I know one of the things, Dr. Shannon, for instance, you've been thinking a lot about is group facilitation, which is not only about addressing the economics, but it's also for what benefits group treatment could potentially offer to patients. And I'm wondering if you could speak about that. Yes, I've become really convinced that group therapy is going to be the core and cornerstone of being able to scale and, and apply psychedelic medicine as it comes out of the labs and uh, research centers. We've been doing a number of groups in our setting, and I really just appreciated seeing the publication by the Roots to Thrive group out of Vancouver, who um, published their experience with 90 plus and three cohorts. There is a more extensive model. We've been uh, working on a grant with uh, five different cohorts of six each. And what we've seen is just incredible improvement. And our focus has been on frontline and first responders in healthcare because we've just seen such massive levels of depression, trauma, and burnout in this through the pandemic that people are calling it the echo pandemic. And uh, we're finding ways that we can deliver this uh, in the one to two hundred dollar a session range, which is a fraction of what we're doing for individual ketamine assisted therapy. And my other belief is that ketamine is our is our working proxy to get training and get experience out in the field. We now have didactics programs like this wonderful one that UPenn has put on and other organizations around, but we really don't have clinical experience outside of research settings. And and that's really going to be the pinch point as we try to scale this with therapists when MDMA is released in a year, year and a half, knock on wood. Yeah, I'd like to get, um, as we talk later, I'd like to get back to that question of ketamine because it's something that comes up very frequently in the in the chats during these sessions because it does happen to be one of the few available medicines out there both for therapists to learn to train and for patients to access. But I want to take a step back and and Dr. Huda, you you speak um, wonderfully about you know your introduction to this field and you came to it really as a skeptic. And um, you've said um, that true heal true healing is more than symptom reduction. And I know we don't have time to hear all that you have to say on the subject, but could, on the subject, but can you share your vision for healing and what these medicines might offer us? And what are the critical things we have to keep an eye on in supporting their emergence in a thoughtful way? Well, I think we have to look for the kind, we have to decide on the kind of outcomes that we're really seeking um, for patients with um, mental health conditions. And so, you know, the symptom improvement is an important thing. It's one thing, but we have done clinical trials in PTSD, um, not with psychedelics, but where symptoms um, dropped a lot. But the patient was still the patient and still had um, a lot of need, a lot of clinical need. And so I think it's a good beginning to reduce symptoms, but 
you know, it's really, I mean, that that's what the beauty is of doing really good preparation is really asking people to talk about what their hopes are with healing. What domains do they want to improve? What kinds of things in their lives um, do they want to um, change? Right. It isn't, you know, most people don't come in with a checklist of symptoms that they want to, um, you know, we want to move from a 10 to a four. Right. That, that's a, that's our world. They, they want to be less angry at, at remarks that people make that they know are not designed to hurt them <laughs> or they want to be able to, um, you know, make decisions for themselves without, you know, second guessing everything, or they want to um, be able to plan for the future without thinking the worst will happen. And I'm not sure which symptom exactly that gets rated on, maybe maybe a bunch, but the idea of healing is really you take a, a, whole, a more holistic goal about how you want your life to change, and you... Um, you engage in a process of preparation such that when the pa patient takes the psychedelic, they're primed to do some processing around those issues that um, they have been prepared that, that they have been preparing for. So I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, you know, psychiatry has gotten a little medicalized with a focus on. Um, I don't think it's a bad focus. Measurement-based care and. PHQ-9 and, you know, PCL, you know, let's let's measure outcomes, um, but usually only symptoms are measured, and so there's a real need and an opportunity to introduce other kind of domains. And, you know, just, to, just back to what um, Dr. Shannon was saying about group, I'm very intrigued by the um, possibilities of group, and I, I'm wondering just I, I know you're the moderator, Steve, but I'm, I'm just really wondering whether you see that as a as a different experience when somebody's um, taking the medicine in a group versus individually, whether they'll be more internalized, for example, with less opportunity to do the psychotherapy on the spot versus later, or just whether it's a scalable idea. It's a great um it's a great opportunity, but just like group therapy is not a proxy for individual therapy, but a supplement to it. I'm just wondering what what the thoughts are, because I think you're right. If if we could find a way to make group the pivot, that would offer an amazing opportunity for, for scalability. I, I don't see it as, a, as an alternative and maybe not even a complement. I think it's a, it's a different technique and it has different power. And I think one of the things that we see in it is it builds community. And I've seen this with group therapy all along, even in non-psychedelic settings, that there's a power that comes with this that it, it's hard to describe or put into words. And what we see is that in a group setting, people end up being the therapist for each other. They tend to normalize their symptoms and uh, they feel held in a different way than we can do in an individual session. Um, it's it's really a different experience and it's a different framework and and I do think actually the more that I've done with this that it requires a bit of different training mm -hmm. um, and that we we have not generally in our current modern healthcare system really um, taken advantage of the power of groups very much it's been dismissed and minimized and and I think psychedelics could benefit greatly, not only from the community and the isolation that it can address, but um, in the power and in the improved access. I think it's got it's got a lot of pieces going for it, and we just don't have much research on it at all. And uh, it's just, I mean, that's what's interesting. It's both the blessing and the curse of this movement right now, is we're on the front edge of so much that it's intriguing to see what we can step into, but uh, a lot of time it's without the guidance and wisdom that, that five or ten years of research can give us. So it sounds like more uh, more opportunity for translational research. Yeah. 
we're, we're at this very interesting moment in the um, reemergence of psychedelics. I mean, they are so much in our zeitgeist. You can't turn on mainstream television without seeing news shows and everything else. And Dr. Ross, you've spoken about the importance of not seeing psychedelics as a panacea, especially in this moment. And in a recent article, um, Dr. Rosalind Watts wrote about her work at Imperial College and how she felt like she had been too simplistic in the way she had spoken publicly about psychedelics in the past. And she wrote that what, what I've learned in the last five years is that the greatest threat to a healthy psychedelic future is the fetishiz fetishizing, fetishizing of just the drug alone. And she cautioned about thinking of psychedelics as a magic bullet, writing that the drug was a catalyst to the therapeutic process, not the therapeutic process itself. And that sadly, this crucial information didn't make the headlines as much as the magic reset button did. So we're rapidly moving toward this regulatory approval and to commercialization. Um, but can you speak about that notion and what's critical to focus on in this moment? Yeah, I, I think psychedelics by themselves, um, without a therapeutic context, psychotherapeutic context, um, they can cause harm, real, real harm. And and they have, and, and it's important to to look at the first wave of this, that the, they were touted as wonder drugs in psychiatry. They were going to cure everything. And then very soon after that, they escaped the labs, ended up on the street. People started using them. It started becoming having psychotic episodes. We, Bellevue saw a lot of this. My hospital in the 60s, people coming in, having psychotic episodes, people be, behaving dangerously. And that occurs. It's not um, uncommon for, you know, this happened a couple of years ago, but it happens every couple of years. A NYU undergrad takes too many mushrooms, has a psychotic delirious event and jumps off a building and, and comes in dead. And, and so in uncontrolled settings, these are powerful drugs that can be dangerous and they can be particularly harmful to people that have underlying psychotic illness. So, but you would think what's going on in the media now that they are a cure-all for everything. And I think that's very dangerous because they're not. The evidence is pretty thin. It's still a very early phase of research. So, but you would, you would look to the lay public and, and people would think, oh, they're available and, and will cure everything. And I, I think that's a real problem. And people using them in uncontrolled settings without proper support a lot of bad things could happen and enough of those start to happen again and there's the potential that all this gets shut down and that people say look these are just too dangerous and have to be suppressed like they have been actually for for centuries in various contexts so i think we have to really pay attention to the history and do this very carefully and methodically um, and educate the public that they're real harms and they're not magic and one of the ways I think that, that there's a support for the emergence of these in a, in a thoughtful way is around training. And Dr. Yudi, you, you mentioned, you know, this bottleneck that's, you know, that's really a, a huge issue to deal with. Um, and Dr. Shannon, this is something that you are dealing with, um, particularly yourself as well. Uh, you're a founding board member of the Board of Psychedelic Medicines and Therapies, um, which is establishing itself as a, um, as a accreditation board in some way, I think. Um, you've, been, so you've been thinking a lot about training and accreditation. And, and is there any update you'd like to share in this conversation about how that process and that conversation is going? Well, I think it's going along quite well. It's our core belief that if we're going to find reimbursement and conventional healthcare system acceptance for psychedelic medicine, we have to have some way to credential therapists so we know someone who's trained, competent from someone who's not. And uh, we stood up our board in December. We've gotten funding from another number of major donors. We've got a test vendor that we're working with. We're going to be going live within the next few weeks, I will say. And um, we anticipate offering a certification test uh, at second quarter of 23. And we've got the support of MAPS, Hepter, Compass, USONA, a number of organizations. Rick Doblin is a huge fan of what we're doing. Amy Emerson is on our board, uh, the CEO of MAPS Public Benefit Corporation. And um, it's, it's a long effort, but we, we think that it'll help bring professional credibility. It helps to define a career path for professionals. I mean, I get calls every week from people saying, how do I get into this? 
People are passionate about this in a way that I've not seen anything else in healthcare approach in the last 30 years. I get calls from people that say, I will move to your clinic next week if, you, if I can work there and do this work. Um, and that's sad, it's frustrating, it's exciting, but uh, the field needs some structure and needs some format. I noticed that NYU, uh, Hopkins, and Yale have gotten together to provide some element of postgraduate training. And we also have a certification, or we also have a membership organization, APA, that's uh, standing up and will be um, providing memberships. And so I think the field is professionalizing, it's maturing. And I think this is what it's going to take for us to move into the next step, which is full healthcare system acceptance and reimbursement. And that's our goal, broad right. access. Mm -hmm. Karen Cooper um, actually spoke at the last session, and she talked a lot about the variety of training programs that were out there or emerging. And, uh, you know, the, the way that we've talked about psychedelics broadly has been to, to put all of these medicines under one umbrella. And the truth is that they're very different very different experiences, uh, very different ways in which you work with them, and and you're also working with very different communities that have different needs. And um, Dr. Huda, you know, you're you're working with a particular community within the VA, and um, and you um, are introducing a training program specifically around the community of veterans and the work that you're doing. And maybe you could share a little bit about that. Uh, yes. So we are we are partnering with Maps to um, offer um, to offer really it's it's a Maps training um, that will allow people who go through the entire process um, to be certified in a way that Maps will accept. So we're starting we have to get our therapists to be trainers and supervisors. So it's going to take a while because we're we're um, just emerging into the space. But the idea was to make this training free of charge for people that work in community settings. Mm -hmm. um, our first training was at for VA providers and mostly people and a few people at Mount Sinai was local, was really mostly the people that um, are at the Bronx VA. Um, but the second one, which is going to be held next week, is going to have representation from um, from 18 different VAs around the country. Um, and this will be free of charge because, again, we've raised the money through a philanthropic gift. Um, and, you know, that's important because one of the things we learned at our training was that the kind of questions that people have that have been working with combat veterans uh, for a long time, very different questions came up than when I went to my MAPS training. Um, and a, it a very different group, um, very different orientation, <laughs> very different concerns. And um, for example, um, the idea of touching patients, you know, that, that took hours to discuss. And in the training I went to, it was like, well, yeah, of course, somatic therapies, we're all somatic therapists. So you, you have to, um, you know, bring people along based on, um, where they are, uh, the people that are at the VA are really experts in PTSD. Um, that is not necessarily broadly true of people who do psychedelic work in general. Um, so, you know, there's an opportunity for um, specialization. And as we get more experience in our clinical trial at the VA, we'll have case material that may be very specific to VA-related issues. So this is just one little corner um, of the world, right? There's, um, many, there's many communities like that. that yeah, are... it's that we, we hope to also um, expand not just in the VA, but to community settings, because our goal is really to get people who aren't enthusiastic yet be aware. One of the most gratifying things about the training that we did at the VA was that no one who had gone to that no one who came to that training had prior experience with psychedelics either personally or professionally or any way <laughs> and by the end even though many people started out kind of dubious or unsure 
everybody learned something very important that they were that they said they would they would be able to take back to their clinical practice whether or not they've they will get a chance to work with psychedelic medicines just about the inner healer intelligence about following patients process um, just a lot of very important things that are um, cornerstones of the type of psychotherapy that is taught in connection with psychedelics. And so I think that um, we're very excited about being able to do that and getting people to be excited. But that's really a first step. Yeah, I love what you're saying because what you're suggesting is that it's not just about the psychedelic medicine or the psychedelic, it's, it's really, there's a, a psychedelic approach even to thinking about psychotherapy and healthcare in general. And, you know, we, it, there really is, I mean, everybody touched on in some way mm -hmm. this, uh, for lack of a better word, a paradigm shift in the way in which we think about mental health and the way in which we think about dealing with things like depression and, and, and PTSD. And in the, in the short film, I mean, Jeff touches on that as well in terms of his experience with it. But, you know, we've talked about these medicines and therapies for everything from addiction to, to treatment resistant depression to PTSD, eating disorders and more. Um, but the question I have for you, and I'd love to turn to you, Dr. Ross, about this, is that is the question of where do these uh, where do these medicines and therapies fit in your mind ultimately in a system of well care? You know, are they simply to fix problems, um, or is there a whole paradigm shift that that they can you know that they're um, asking for, which is to sustain wellness and good mental health in well people? Are we having the full conversation? Yeah, I, um, it, it's interesting to consider how they can be used for wellness. They, they have been for thousands of years. Uh, there are religious communities. An example is the Native American church in peyote. There, uh, peyote is a religious sacrament, about 250,000 members of Native American church. And, and when those groups are studied, they, uh, they tend to be healthy communities. And the psychedelic is part of the spiritual religious thing, and it helps promote bonding in the community. So I, I think from the perspective of spiritual wellness, you, you would want to look to communities like that and, and others. Um, you know, there have been some studies in normal volunteers. I mean, there was the famous Good Friday experiment where Walter Pankey gave um, psilocybin to divinity students to see if it could occasion mystical experiences. And um, that was followed up by a study at Hopkins in 2006 where uh, normal volunteers were given psilocybin and they rated it among the most meaningful and spiritual experiences of their lives that had lasting benefit, um, including increases in altruism and, and other pro-social benefits. Um, Hopkins and NYU followed up uh, another study in normal volunteers. We've administered high-dose psilocybin to religious professionals and we're seeing how it may inform their religious and spiritual lives. Um, so I, I think, um, we can do research in normal volunteers. There is some evidence that it can improve well-being. But I think to jump from that and to use it in the community and hoping that that will improve well-being, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, psychedelics can also be used in ways that are not good in the community. I think of Charles Manson as an example and, and others where they can be used for you know, evil purposes. So it, it depends on how they're used in a community. but you know, for me, my, my focus is on their use in medicine and helping sick people. But I think they could have benefit beyond that if used carefully. Thanks for that. I love, uh, go I ahead, love Bob Jesse's term, uh, the betterment of well people. And, yeah. you know, I, I think it's an interesting uh, sort of dilemma to be put in. If someone comes to you without a very significant diagnosable uh, axis three, axis, you know, uh, predominant issue, Axis 5, what, are, are we able to treat them? Should we treat them? And I think it's one of the challenges as we move from a suppressive model of the psyche where we feel, feared the contents into an evocative model where we honor the contents and honor the process. Do we draw a line between healthy and ill somewhere? And do we turn down people that just want to become healthier? the betterment of well people. I, th I think this paradigm is gonna push that question and I think the communities that are building around it, particularly the decrim community and obviously the spiritual uh, well-being community 
are going to be increasingly challenging that medical framework. Very much so. And I do want to touch on the the alternative channels to the medical path that these things are coming out on. But but before we go there, I want to talk about a particular community, and that's a community that uh, that we will all be a part of um, at one point, which is uh, the end of life community. And I know, Dr. Ross, this is something that you're particularly interested in. And uh, if you can talk to to that community in particular, uh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I, I think this is the area within medicine and then beyond that, that psychedelics are the most promising. Um, psychedelics have, have been used for thousands of years by religious groups. One of the ways they're used is to help people who are dying to aid in the dying mm -hmm. process. And um, and the second most promising area of research from the first era, 50s and 70s, after LSD to treat alcohol use disorder was the use of LSD to treat terminal cancer. Um, it started with this guy, Eric Cast, who, uh, pretty amazing, he was a Viennese uh, psychiatrist, trained at the University of Chicago as a, both a psychiatrist and internist, and was a pain researcher. He heard about LSD being made by Sandoz. This was in the early 60s. Knew nothing about its psychological properties. Ordered some up and started giving it to terminally ill cancer patients in inpatient setting who had refractory pain syndromes. Would give them 100 mics of LSD and had this, you know, chemotherapy model and found um, that patients reported rapid reductions in pain that lasted up to three weeks from single dose but also started to say, I'd no longer have a fear of death. He was the first to report reductions in existential distress and well-being. And he gave it to over 250 uh, participants in research settings. He did a comparative efficacy study versus two opioids. Uh, and that work was very promising. And there was a group at Spring Grove led by Stan Groff that found something very similar in a group of outpatients. And in the modern era, a group of us picked up on that, our group at NYU, one at Hopkins and UCLA. And together we've run 92 participants, single dose psilocybin, high dose in conjunction with existential and supportive psychotherapy, and have found rapid reductions in depression and anxiety, long-term sustained benefits in those. But very interestingly, we also found reductions in existential distress and demoralization syndrome and fear of death. And this is probably the most rewarding work I've ever done. Um, I was very nervous and skeptical to give dying cancer patients a psychedelic back in 2007, 2008. And we kept seeing the same thing, that people very rapidly by the end of the session were feeling so much better, continued to say so. And, and after finishing that study, I thought there's something really interesting and important going on here therapeutically. And so it's really become my, my mission at this point to do more studies in this population because I think the signal is so strong and promising. And not just for end-of-life cancer, I think any end-of-life condition. Uh, and we're all going to die, right? So the, the confrontation, the human confrontation with death and fear around it strikes all of us. Freud thought that was the ultimate fear. And I, I think psychedelics, when used very carefully by skilled therapists, that could really aid people uh, who are dying approach death with, with dignity and, and spiritual and emotional well-being. I, I want to, for me, there's a bridge between what you're saying about uh, end of life and the conversation we're having about the non-patient or, or well people, and that is the community that surrounds the patient. The, um, and uh, we talked about it um, before, Dr. Ross, about the family members of those who are in uh, a transition state in the end of their life and the ways in which they can potentially be left behind when uh, somebody's gone through a therapeutic process and is a, in a very different place maybe than their family members. And, and Dr. Huda, I think about the work with veterans uh, very strongly in that regard. When you look at the film of Jill and Jeff, you can very much feel, you know, Jeff's processing and, and Jill's in a, in a parallel situation, but but um, dealing with her own traumas. Um, and, you know, as you are bringing this into the VA community, it's not just the veterans, but it's also the family members and those closest to them. I'm wondering how all of you, if, if anybody can talk to that notion of treating a system. Well, um, 
the, a lot of the studies that are planned in the VA, I think appropriately, are using MDMA for couples um, when one veteran has PTSD and the, the spouse does not necessarily have PTSD. And um, so far in um, pilot studies, MDMA seems to really um, be very positive for that situation. Um, I think ultimately in those situations when the discrepancy gets too big, um, maybe the spouse does try to also seek their own healing um, if they feel they need it. Right? Not everybody feels they do. So I've also seen documentaries where then the wife also embarked on um, similar healing. I think uh, the one I watched was from shock to awe where that happened. Um, so, yeah, I mean, eventually systems, but um, again, in the beginning, there are going to be limited resources and limited availability. And, you know, who do you want to prioritize? I think is a very interesting question. I mean, if everyone can benefit, how do you, how do you choose? How do you set it up? <laughs> right. Dr. Ross, thoughts about that? Yeah, so, you know, very much serious medical illness like advanced cancer is, is a systems illness. It doesn't just affect the patient, it affects the whole system around it. So when you look at rates of psychiatric and existential distress in um, caregivers like spouses and other family members and care providers like, let's say, the oncologists and nurse practitioners, rates of distress approach what the patient is experiencing. And anybody that's dealt with somebody who, who's dying can see that the whole family system, treatment system is affected. And the doctors and nurses, you see it as burnout and the family members, you know, they can have existential distress and other kind of distress. So we, we've designed, um, in, in thinking about that, we've designed a couple studies. One is the same model, single dose psilocybin, but to help the family members who are experiencing psychiatric and existential distress. And we designed another one to help the care providers like the oncologists. We, um, those are still concepts. At some point, we are going to do those. Uh, it took on some, um, it really became germane with COVID with at Bellevue in the beginning of the pandemic, the hospital in New York City in general was just overrun by so many people dying of COVID. And my frontline colleagues were just devastated and demoralized, the ICU workers, the ER docs. And so a colleague of mine, Tony Back at University of Washington, he came up with the idea of using psilocybin assisted psychotherapy to help frontline COVID workers. And Scott, I think you were talking about using ketamine to do something similar. So I Yeah, that's our current grant. And I was motivated by this by my daughter who was an ICU nurse and was working at Deaconess in the surge in Boston. And I saw the trauma that she went through and heard the stories. And I mean this was battlefield conditions that she was in. And um that motivated me to write this grant and start doing this work. And I think there's such a huge unmet need. 40 to 60 percent of physicians in a in a first line, front line care delivery are burnt out. And um, we need to care for our own, or we're going to cycle back into a different kind of a, a traumatic situation where we can't function hospitals because of the loss of nurses and physicians. I'm really glad we're having this part of the conversation because oftentimes when you want to talk about nurses or healthcare workers and psychedelics, it's how do they participate in an ecosystem and uh, in, in not necessarily dealing with basic humanity and the question of suffering. Um, and, you know, when you talk about frontline healthcare workers, there's a clear analogy to veterans. I mean, even some of the same vocabulary. Um, and uh, I know even that question of moral injury. I asked my brother, who's run you know some major hospitals, had he ever heard the term moral injury as related to healthcare workers? And he said we use it all the time. And so having that conversation and and looking at how do we um, how do we take care of those who take care of us is a really important question. And I think some of the commonalities we see with that is in general it's not been okay to talk about it. It's not discussed, and um, and 
particularly with the men, but it's really across the board. Um, you just sort of buck up and go back to work. And um, it, it's just beginning to make this okay to have this discussion and to have an experience about your trauma and recognize that it can be debilitating and it needs to be addressed. And I think that's one of the values we see with ketamine is it just begins to help to open up the conversation and it helps to bond the group together in a shared experience. Yeah, I'm glad you came, we went back to ketamine because that's a question, as I said, that's come up in many of these sessions. And I'm wondering, like, do you see ketamine as having a specific treatment niche in the psychedelic pharmacopoeia once MDMA and psilocybin come out? Um, or is it, you know, um, the training wheels of psychedelics for some, Reason. I mean, we hear you. You hear the whole range of the ways in which it's it's approached and described. And I know it's a it's a medicine that you've been working with, Dr. Shannon. I'm just wondering how everybody thinks about that. I think it's very useful. And I think uh, 10 years from now, when we have MDMA, psilocybin, DMT, and other agents available, that I would still see ketamine as a key option in the palate. Number one, it's got a short course of action. Number two. It's anxiolytic, whereas some of the other medicines can be anxiogenic, build anxiety. And it's often, sometimes the uh, conventional psychedelics can be a bit of a challenge, challenging first step. It's kind of jumping into the deep end of the pool, if you will. Um, it, it's, I think, much more compatible with people with significant medical issues. It's, it's easier to manage. We have a great deal of experience with it, and it's quite safe. Um, yeah, I've, I've written a paper that I think it's really a pivot point that as physicians begin to work with this more in a medication assisted model as opposed to an infusion model, what I see happening with physicians that do that after they have a few conversations when they're in an infusion setting and they have a few sessions where they process with someone their experience, all of a sudden they want training in uh, medication assisted psychotherapy because they realize that it's the next tier. Uh, and ketamine can help depression just straight away as an infusion, but I think it's really a, a very elegant tool in, in our palate. It's not the best, like MDMA is better for trauma, there's no doubt about it. And if we needed to um, really address treatment-resistant depression, I'd probably rather have psilocybin. But in general office use of an outpatient psychiatry practice, it's invaluable. I would want to agree with that, and especially um, the point about how ketamine practitioners are starting to think about combining it with psychotherapy, which was not how ketamine was approved. Um, but people are now finding that this might actually be necessary. Um, and so we're hearing a, a lot about a lot of studies in which people are going to see whether they can increase the length between doses of ketamine by offering kind of a ketamine-assisted psychotherapy protocol. And I think as ketamine is used the way other psychedelics are used with psychotherapy, this may prove to be a remarkably efficient tool, particularly because you can take it with other medications. Um, it's, it's a lot of, it's practical, very practical. And so that, you know, talking about scalability, practical is a very big asset to scalability. It also is, it, it, oh, please, Dr. No, Shannon. Go ahead, Steve. Um, I, was gonna, I was just going to say that, it, you know, it's also the, the first time we're seeing the commercialization of a psychedelic medicine. And we're seeing uh, ketamine clinics, whether they're infusion clinics or um, assisted psychotherapy clinics popping up in cities all over the U.S. We're seeing advertisements for ketamine where, um, on social media where you can have it you know, delivered to your door and uh, jump on a Zoom call uh, to integrate. Um, so, uh, and the one thing we do know about it in, in all of its uh, benefits is that it is, it has a, a, an addictive profile that's different than some of the other medicines. So, uh, again, I, I, I you know the question of of how these things emerge and how do we 
how do we build a culture of respect for them like we need with any medicine? I'm really afraid that we're headed for a train wreck with ketamine from what I've seen. Um, so I'm prepared for that. And I think, you know, talking about the blush off the rose, I think the blush is off the rose with psychedelics a little bit because the the whole industry has begun to consolidate. The uh, psychedelics ETF investment index has dropped by like 50 percent, particularly after Compass published their 2B data. So I think we're in this area where we're going to get some realism about psychedelics here very quickly. And we have to be prepared for that sort of backlash. I know there's been some negative press published about uh, uh, MDMA and other agents recently. So I think we're all dealing with the, the sort of the beginning of the second tier, which is more realism about psychedelics. Yeah, there's a there's a really thoughtful question that came um, from the audience today, tonight, and it made me think about the like in the in the defense uh, world, in the military world. There's not only talk about how do you use psychedelics to deal with PTSD, but it's also how do you use them, perhaps even on the battlefield, to make for better soldiers. Um, and uh, and the question, you know, even of healthcare workers. And there's, so I'm going to read you the question, and uh, and I think it's provocative, and it's something that would be interesting to get each of your takes on. And the question is, what would be the ethical concerns? of improving healthcare workers' psychological and emotional well-being to continue functioning in a system that's set up to inflict moral injury? Are we making people better so they can continue accepting the toxic system that they work in? And I think this is a, a valuable you know, question um, from a healthcare-specific audience. My dog heard your dog. <laughs> I don't have no. a dog. Maybe maybe I could answer. <laughs> That'd be great. I don't think the idea. I don't think that giving this to healthcare workers would be analogous to how we try to patch soldiers up and send them back in the field. In general, um, in the 60s and 70s, when people took psychedelics, they didn't want to go to war afterwards. Um, so there's that. But I think the idea of having a healthcare worker be treated for um, their burnout is really a way for the healthcare worker to do some work in deciding what they want to do next, to, to really kind of have the space to um, figure out whether this is burnout, whether they need a little reinforcement or a timeout, or whether this isn't. <laughs> This isn't what they thought it would be, which is a lot of times how it plays out in the combat theater also, that people may sign up to go to war, and once they're there, it's not what they thought it would be, and they don't feel the way they thought they would feel. And um, they suffer they suffer a lot after. So I don't think the purpose of treating frontline healthcare workers for burnout is to be able to patch them back up and send them into the war zone or the combat theater. I think the purpose is to really give somebody the space to, to figure out what they feel. Um, that That's how I would use the opportunity. I think it's it's working with the individual to change the system. It's difficult to change the system from the top down, but when we get cohorts of nurses and emergency room docs that talk about their trauma load and begin to vent and share, it starts to influence. And all of a sudden, the medical director of the hospital is listening to you, and the, the chief nursing officer are listening, um, because they recognize that, I mean, it costs 50% of an annual salary to replace staff. and uh, they're trying to keep their their boat afloat as well, but I think we always start with the individual and have to have compassion and, and treatment available, and hopefully it changes the system. Dr. Ross, thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't I don't see how psychedelics change the culture of medicine or our healthcare system. They they certainly need to be improved. Um, I mean, for instance, in my medical training, I learned nothing about helping people who were dying. 
were trained to save people's lives. You never, ever give up. So there was a real lacuna when I went to go try to help somebody who was dying. It's not there at all. And I think that's like one of the most important things you can learn in, in medicine is, is to do that. So that, that was a big glaring problem. And I, th that's why the work in end-of-life care with psychedelics has been so appealing to me because it's missing from my education. And actually, I'm, I'm here in Los Angeles uh, visiting my family. My mom was a um, hospice worker here when I was a teenager, took me to hospice. And I saw this like beautiful thing, people having good deaths, completely then absented from my medical training. And also our healthcare system is... Um, is very poor systemically in so many ways. We spend way too much at the end of life and we don't do a very good job of prevention and the, mis the incentives are all misaligned in healthcare. So I, I think our, there's a lot, a lot of problems and many places to, to fix things. I don't think psychedelics necessarily, I, the idea of like fixing the individual person and then put them back in, I agree with Rachel, that that's, um, you know, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I think that you're you're right that for most of uh, of our culture we don't die well in this country and in this culture, um, and we also tend to I mean of course you know there's there's trauma that people experience and um, but when we talk about depression and anxiety you know depression and anxiety could often be an appropriate response to the world that we've created um, and the things that we endure as part of being human. And it makes you wonder whether the, and, and I think you, you think about this in regards to the, um, to those at the end of life and dealing with some of these existential distresses that the issue can oftentimes be less a medical issue than a spiritual issue, and a, a, a question of connection or of meaning. And, um, and that makes me wonder about the parallel tracks of the emergence of these, of these medicines, not only in a medical setting, but in um, a setting of spiritual communities, for instance, and wondering how you see that in relationship to uh, to these medicines coming out in a medical framework. Well, I see three three paths forward for us from here. One is medicalization in the conventional healthcare arena, with or without insurance reimbursement, hopefully with. The other path is the decrim wellness model that steps away from a medical model tries to step away from diagnosis, it's more of a healing, supporting recovery and healing. And then the final path is the spiritual trajectory. And I think, I think you know, 10 years from now, we're gonna see robust communities around each of those. And I think an individual patient or a person will be able to sort out where they fit best, hopefully. And we're gonna have some misfits in each category that what might be better suited in another category. But I think, you know, the challenge is that we're not going to have really a system to triage people correctly. It's going to be individual choice preference. One thing we're seeing, especially like as, you're, as the certification board is emerging, is this question of who, who will be certified. And uh, it speaks to this question as well. You know, what does is, what is professional certification look like? Um, how do you treat those who maybe have been doing this work in the underground for the last half a century um, and may have more practical knowledge, if not um, classroom knowledge or, or therapeutic knowledge? And then how do you deal with um, a spirit with a psychedelic chaplaincy, for instance? Um, well, our first, our, our central motivation is to work with licensed healthcare professionals, likely mental health care professionals, but they're there may be a path in for non-mental health care health professionals that have a mental health experience. But the, the first, to, to get acceptance and reimbursement, we have to work with people that have been licensed. Now, we are looking at a second tier, which would be unlicensed people, probably in a supportive role in a healthcare setting under the liability and uh, aegis of someone who's licensed. That's really the currently the only model we can conceptualize that uh, unlicensed people could be brought in. And they may wish to continue under groundwork, they may wish to work in the sort of burgeoning decrim movement, but um, it's a big challenge for us to understand how we offer credibility and recognition for that experience. But our current healthcare system 
uh, that's a foreign language to them. That, that's the challenge we have. Other thoughts? I see heads shaking. There's a question that that um, that has been asked um, several times in these mm -hmm. sessions and has yet to be answered, and and um, I thought it would be a, a good question for this panel. And was thinking about you, Dr. Ross, in particular around this question of comorbidities. Um, and actually, it probably comes up in the VA work as well, and certainly in your work, Dr. Shannon. But the, the Giovanna from San Francisco was asking about uh, clinical trials with people with comorbidities, people who have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, for instance, and um, is there any talk about uh, reaching no. those populations? There's yeah, a lot of, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, Rachel, you go ahead. There's a there's a lot of talk about that. Um, one of the one of the ways that people are talking about psychedelics in general is as transdiagnostic tools. If the idea of the psychedelic is to facilitate a psychotherapeutic process and not to kind of restore the pathophysiology of a specific illness, um, which is why you, you might take a different kind of medicine, then this theoretically should be a tool that would tolerate some certain comorbidities. But I think that it's important to, to do the research to find out um, which ones may not be so um, amenable. So, for example, with psychosis, people are very concerned about that. Um, others say on the contrary, but only re good research will tell us um, what to do. And it's just very important to not substitute theory for data in this regard, because it could really swing both ways. Um, but the idea here is not that we're using a medicine to restore a specific uh, biology of, of a mental illness to the extent that they may differ from diagnosis to diagnosis, which is questionable. The idea here is that we're facilitating a process. And the circumstances under which that is a good idea versus not such a good idea are still things that I think need to be Flushed out a little more. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Yeah, comorbidity um, is the norm in clinical care. I mean, you know, you, you typically have people like, like, let's take PTSD for example. About half will have a co-occurring substance use disorder, um, and, and that's the you know mood disorders co-occur with anxiety disorders. Very rarely do you get like an isolated alcohol use disorder by itself or PTSD by itself. Which so is why it, it's so hard to, to, to populate a clinical trial, probably. Well, there have been some attempts. There's a trial at Hopkins uh, using psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy to help people with co-occurring major depression and alcohol use. With um, And there's actually one that Dr. Yehuda and I uh, have a concept that we're developing, extending the work with MDMA and PTSD, um, and thinking of trauma. Trauma begets all kinds of problems, not just PTSD, but um, substance use disorders, dissociative disorders, and also borderline personality disorder. So Dr. Yehud and I are looking to use MDMA-assisted psychotherapy to treat the co-occurrence of, of PTSD and borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder is uh, uh, arguably the most disabling personality disorder. It's highly stigmatized. Um, and there's an evidence base that, that certain psychotherapies and, and combined psychotherapies that combine prolonged exposure with DBT can be helpful. So we're, we're looking to treat that co-occurring um, issue related to, uh, you know, probably like something like childhood sexual trauma. So I, I think it's, and also you can also think of compassionate care. Uh, you can try to get a compassionate care IND either for single use or for groups of people and there you're able to include comorbidity uh, in something like that. And, and then when they're clinically available, you'll be able to use them without being constrained by a protocol. You'll be able to use your clinical judgment, and there you'll be treating co-occurrence in, in a variety of interesting ways. You know, I was going to say that once MDMA is released, we're going to have a lot of experience that we don't have now, and it'll be interesting to see because Right now, we have a very narrow treatment protocol in our phase three study, but uh, once it's released, 
it becomes probably looser and looser over time. So, um, but that's how the field matures. But I think there's going to be some real learning that occurs along the way because we don't know the answer to a lot of these questions. Well, and it strikes me that that uh, you're one of the few practitioners that actually had the opportunity to work with these medicines before they were scheduled um, and without the REMS kind of framework around it. So um, maybe maybe for another session, but it'll be really interesting to talk about your experiences with that, Dr. Shannon. But we've talked about the challenges um, in tonight uh, of all of this emerging. We've talked about the opportunities as well, but maybe for each of you to just take a moment and talk about uh, about you know a, a, a motivating thought that keeps you going right now uh, in the work that you're doing because it's challenging work and uh, maybe something that um, that you're excited about as you're um, taking these next steps. I, I would say for me the the most exciting thing. I, I'm a clinician at heart. I've, I've also had a private practice the last 21 years. So there's I absolutely love treating people and. Um, you know, you go into medicine because you want to help people and for people to get better. Um, I think for me, the work with psychedelics and end-of-life care, and also I'm, I'm an MDMA for PTSD therapists, I would say those two populations are incredibly rewarding because you take people who are very distressed, very sick, stuck, high rates of suicide and other bad outcomes, and to see people so dramatically get better and to have such sustained responses is incredibly rewarding and I, I think those areas we have to uh, continue to research uh, but it, it's really the, the experience of helping someone we saw the video of the person who was completely transformed and and that really moves me on a human level when you can help people so that that motivates me to keep going to be very careful and methodical and and if these emerge as treatments I mean things like PTSD, end-of-life care, depression, I mean, they're among the worst conditions facing humanity. And if we can make a dent in any of those, that, that would be great. Thank you for that. Dr. Shannon. Yeah, I agree. I, I think sitting with someone who's had 20 years of psychotherapy and been on 15 different psychiatric meds, while they take MDMA and to watch them heal in front of your eyes is just magical. I don't know how else to say it. And um, it's not always perfect, but uh, it is just motivating for me every time. And it, it uh, makes the piles of paperwork that we have to put up with um, feasible and workable. But uh, that keeps me going. I'm, I'm inspired by that every time. Well, those are, are great. Uh, I think is um, to see how excited our um, clinicians are to have a potential tool that might make a difference. They care so much about the populations that they treat, um, particularly at the VA. And, you know, a lot of times when a patient doesn't get better, we say the patient is treatment resistant, which is just another way of, I think, <laughs> I don't know, blaming the patient for not working hard enough or, or saying it's you, not my treatment. Um, but often there's a frustration from the clinician also who's trying really hard that maybe they're not a good enough doctor or, or nurse or social worker, and it's frustrating all around. But one of the things that has been so heartwarming to me is to see um, clinicians come to life at the idea that they may be able to effect a real healing process for someone. I'm so um, hopeful for the patients, but you know, we talked a lot about burnout in this hour. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons you get burnout isn't just because you're working too hard, but because everyone's dying around you or not getting better. Yeah. I mean, it, I see how hard people are working to um, set up this opportunity so hard, so many hours. It's not easy work to do. Um, but I think it's all worth it when, when they know that they've made a difference in somebody's transformational change. So that's what keeps me going. Um, that, is a, that is a beautiful. Yeah. 
a beautiful thought to end this panel on. Um, I was excited to do this from the start, and it was even uh, more wonderful than I imagined. I want to thank each of you, Dr. Yehuda, Dr. Ross, Dr. Shannon, for participating in this conversation uh, tonight with me. I, uh, for all the work that you're doing in the world and the love and the care that you provide to the people that you care for and their families. Uh, I also, you know, these are medicines of connection. And I want to take a moment and recognize the connection that was uh, felt and created by everybody who participated tonight, everybody from around the country um, who was reaching out to each other and sending chat messages, um, going back between the sessions. There are WhatsApp groups that have been created. There's all kinds of wonderful things going on from this series. And I want to thank everybody um, for taking the time out of their schedules to participate. Um, if you'd like to um, stay abreast of, of uh, of our work at Reconsider with nursing, uh, with healthcare workers, as well as vets and first responders and others, you could simply send us an email at community at reconsider.org, uh, and we'll make sure to keep you up to date. Um, and uh, there will be another session on March 30th. I think that Randy's going to talk about that. Uh, with that, I just want to say thank you to everybody, uh, and have a good night. Q&A. Thank you for joining tonight, and a big thank you to Dr. Ross, Dr. Shannon, and Dr. Yehuda for sharing your expertise and passion with us. We hope everyone found it interesting and informative. For tonight's attendees, you'll be receiving an email within the next few days, which will include the following. Some resources that our expert panel recommends, information about receiving nursing continuation education credits, a link to the recording, and a feedback survey. Even though our series is near complete, we still encourage you to share your feedback as we continue to improve this series and consider future psychedelic learning opportunities. The next and final session in this series, Access to Psychedelic Medicine, will be on Wednesday, March 30th, at the same time from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Registration for each session needs to be done individually. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We hope to see you for the final session in this series.